Hello, everybody, and welcome to Zoom and Connect. I'm Alexis Brink. I'm the president of Jinshin Institute, and I'm the newest and latest member of the Inclusion, Equity, and Social Action Committee for the USATAA. And I'm happy and honored to introduce to you the moderators for the Facebook page of Project TA101, Personal Tools for Social Transformation. Welcome all of you. And I would first like to introduce Janice Dowson. She is a TSTA in psychotherapy in Canada and the coordinator of Project TA101. And we have Anisha Pandya. She's a PTSTA in psychotherapy in Mumbai, India. Welcome. It's so nice to see you. Nice to be here, Alexis and, and Anisha. I'm so glad we're going to have this time to talk today. I know. And we, uh, Susan, she may still join us, but I know that the UK, they reset their um, schedules. So they fell back, right? And so um, I guess she's going to be on next hour, but we'll interview her another time. So we'll start with you. Um, Janice, let me start with you. Mm -hmm. How did you first get interested in TA? Well, a long time ago in 1976, when I worked in adolescent treatment, I attended a TA 101 training with a man named Vince Gilpin in Ottawa. And he was one of the past presidents of ITAA. Um, it, it was that 101 was a transformative moving experience for me so much so that I moved to the West Coast where there were so many trainers to get training right away. Um, because I noticed that the adolescents that I worked with then found TA tools really easy to grasp. And um, they understood the common language in transactional analysis and they grasped the practical tools to make the changes that they wanted to make in their lives. Mm -hmm. And so you started to practice it fairly quickly and did you see good results with them? Oh, I, amazing the results. They, teenagers grasp TA concepts very, very quickly. And I think that it speaks to the young person, the child in all of us, the language and the practical tools, the depth. Um, all my clients actually of all ages uh, really grasp the tools and start using them to make changes in their lives. That's yeah, great because yesterday I was talking to my son who's in college and he, he just turned 21 and this personal thing, but he's gone through a little bit of a breakup and he says, mom, I'm feeling so sad and I know, you know, that I have to move on. And as I explained to him, I said, you know, the feeling parts, they come from the child and then your adult can make the other decisions. So it is so practical. I mean, he never studied TA, but he totally gets it. It's mm -hmm. like when you mention it to people, they understand already. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that's really, the language yeah. is really easy to grasp, but the, com the, the, complex, the concepts are deep and Very. really with people's human experience. Yeah, absolutely. And Anisha, you are in India. Uh, what is the community like there? Do you have a big community? We have a huge community and it's a very thriving community. Uh, we have many TSTAs, many PTSTAs, many CTAs, and also many people who are on their way of becoming CTAs. Big community. Oh, very wow. active. Uh, yeah, that's great. And how do you see your journey in TA having impacted your personal and professional life? Uh, I see it has impacted uh, me fully as a person. So I know that for me, uh, it's been life pre-TA and life post-TA. Mm. In terms of who I have become as a person and especially the core philosophies of TA. Uh, and the first one, um, people are okay. Mm -hmm. For me, that has been the most life-changing um, thing to really internalize. I see how I have changed as a mother. I see my relationship with my son is so much uh, about not having power over him, but creating this whole space of an okay okayness for both of mm. us and to have a more shared power. And TA gave me the tools to be able to create that uh, with my son, with my friends, and also as a therapist, I think my uh, TA is the soul of the work that I do. Mm -hmm. Do you have a private practice? 
yes, I do have a private practice. Um, I, I just had another question, which is an interest of mine, but coming from India, do you feel that the um, okayness, is that in a way part of the culture there already? Where you are, because in the West, it's kind of, you know, like from a core, we are all okay, we're born okay. Is that, do you see that culturally? Do you see that people understand yeah, I, that? Uh, I think that's an interesting question um, you ask, Alexis, because in India, uh, we speak about our source being one. So if our source is one, how can we all not be okay? Mm. So it very much blends with what are the core values of my culture. Nice. Yeah. Because that's a little different here, right, uh, Janice, in the West? Well, like... uh, that, I'm just remembering one of the things that Felipe Garcia says over and over again in the um, TA 101 modules. He talks about that, yes, we are okay, meaning we have worth, value, and dignity. And at the same time, he invites everyone to enact okayness through behavior. Uh, does it just separate okayness and behavior as some do, but he invites everyone to enact um, our cultural uh, beliefs of okayness through treating everyone with respect and reflecting our own okayness by treating others with respect and treating ourselves with dignity and respect also. Um, so yeah. I, don't, I don't have an answer for you, but culturally here, but I, I'm just thinking about Felipe's invitation to all of us to really put our okayness in practice. Yeah, so to do it through our behavior, I think is a really good idea because then we can practice it and then we can get used to it again just by the way we're acting. Yeah, and I think that that's a way to enact social change. Um, do, are there, do you have any uh, groups also in uh, India? Because TA is really expressed also through groups, right? Yeah. So I, as I told you before that there are many trainers in India and each trainer has their own groups. And while I am in the third year of my PDSTA, I already have three groups of trainees and with each group having 11 to 12 members. Wow. Cool. And I also run a group therapy based on TA. Oh, wonderful. And it's so exciting. Our there's very so, sorry, there's, I'm getting excited. There's so much going on. That's wonderful to know, Anisha. Janice, uh, what is the importance of Project TA 101 and how did it get started? Well, um, it was really a spark, as I've said to you before, that happened between all of us. And the importance is that in our current cultural moment, we know that TA principles of worth, value, and dignity, the real philosophical principles, are um, much more important than ever in today's world. Um, TA concepts now in this project are accessible to anyone, ev anywhere, who wants to understand, predict, and change what happens when people talk to each other and to enable cultural change. It started in 2019 when the 50th anniversary conference uh, in Raleigh, North Carolina, that both of you were there. Um, yeah, it was fun to see you there. Um, when that conference was announced, um, our committee proposed to Van Joins, who had, had done a lot of work in social justice and racial and economic equality, um, to organize an innovative different social justice focused TA 101 that the training, um, this training was then professionally video recorded, but he started it by creating the official content and adding in how social uh, and economic um, injustices can be addressed through TA concepts. Is there one little example you can give or, I mean, I've been watching yes. them and I was there. It's so interesting. And yes, well, Valerie Val Batts was, yeah. Yeah, Valerie oh. Batts talks a lot about um, how the ego state model can be used to um, combat internalized oppression, to change prejudice. Uh, she, in the, when she talks about contracting, which I'm gonna talk about later, she really talks about the art of contracting by addressing 
uh, increasing the nurturing and um, self-compassion as a way to combat racism and prejudice. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah, I was there and it was very powerful how she translated everything into culture and social action and all of that. Yeah, it was great. Um, Anisha, I have a question for you. How do you see, we've covered a little bit already, but how do you see TA, TA is important for the next gen generations? And can you give some examples? Because I know you work with some very young people, even your own son and friends. Can you tell me how, how you do so that? So I, I think some of the concepts of TA are so, so, so powerful and they can be used with any age group. Like I have used them with kids who are in the age range of eight to 10. So I teach them the concept of drama triangle. But what we do is that I draw this one small triangle and one big triangle on the floor. And I make the kids stand there. I explain the concept to them in, in kids language in very simple language that they would understand. And then I ask them to think about a situation where they got into some kind of a conflict. Now, just a few days ago, I'll tell you what happened with my son. My son uh, had a tiff with my husband. Uh, they both had an argument and I could see uh, them shouting. And then my son comes and says, mom, I need you to rescue us. <laughs> so I said, What's going on? And he immediately drew the triangle on the floor. And he tells me, mom, I really wanted to sleep some more. And that woke me up. And he, I've told him many times, don't pat me and wake me up, but daddy, chose this not to listen to me. And like, I was feeling so upset because my sleep was disrupted and I was feeling like a victim internally. So my internal triangle, I wasn't the victim. Wait, can you, can you one second, since Sue's, Sue is not gonna be here, can you just briefly explain the uh, drama triangle for people who don't know about it and then go into your story? Just yeah. briefly, yeah. simply. Sure. So drama triangle has three roles. You know, as we all know, for any movie, any, any drama, we have three roles, right? There can be no theater, no theater, no movie without these three roles. Uh, the first one being persecutor or the aggressor, where in very simple terms, we call the villain, who's being the villain here, yeah? Mm -hmm. Then is the victim. The villain, the villain will be villain only if he has a victim, no? He has to have somebody to abuse. And now between the hero, uh, sorry, between the villain and the victim, there has to come a hero. The Masiha, who will just solve the problem, who will magically rescue the victim and teach the lesson to the persecutor. So that is the drama triangle with the three distinct roles. The rescuer, the victim, and the persecutor. Right. And so now can you put it uh, the story of your son into this drama triangle? Yeah. Again? So it's interesting <laughs> that we all have we engage in two drama triangles. One is how we behave with others externally, and one is what goes on inside our mind. And maybe I can explain that giving my son's example. Uh, so my son said that internally he was feeling victimized by my husband. He said that I've told daddy not to pat me while waking me up, but he always does that. So he was feeling very victimized. He felt that his boundaries were not respected. So he said internally, I was feeling like a victim. I was so upset. And I was feeling helpless that daddy doesn't listen to me. And I said, okay, and what did you do? He's like, I shouted at him. I yelled at him. So I said, aha, so where did you see yourself in the outer triangle? So he jumped on the persecutor end and he said, mom, I persecuted him. I said, what did you say? So I said, you're a bad daddy. You should never wake me up. I want mama to wake me up. You just don't know how to wake up a child. <laughs> So what were you feeling that time? Like I was feeling so angry. I wanted to teach daddy a lesson. I wanted to hurt him. I said, I see. And I said, what do you, what happened then? And then he turns and tells me it was a flop show, mom. And I said, what do you mean? He said, then he drew another triangle. And he said, daddy also jumped in as a persecutor. He said, don't you dare speak to me like that. And he raised my volume. He raised his volume double than my volume. I said, aha, uh -huh. now what happened to you? He's like, I felt scared. And I switched into being a victim and I started crying. I said, and then what happened? He's like, I was hoping that you will come in as a rescuer. <laughs> uh, that's incredible. 
it was interesting when he was doing that and i asked him what were the different options for you because as you say that this is result in a resulted in a messy space what do you think daddy is feeling he said yeah daddy is showing that he's angry but maybe even he is hurt and there is susan hi susan yeah. <laughs> welcome me no i'm so sorry the clocks went back the day before <laughs> yesterday and i completely missed i have five o'clock in my head anyway oh, no. I am. welcome i'm so glad, glad you're here it. great <laughs> We, uh, so it's really wonderful to have you. And Anisha just gave a little example of the triangle, the drama triangle. So we're going oh, to yeah, well, ask you about it. We're going to ask you a little bit more about it later. Okay. Um, I just, yeah, I just want to, I just want to introduce Susan. Um, wait, where's my? <laughs> Let me <laughs> just say uh, while yes, you're finding, ahead, you while go. you're thinking about it's that. Fine. Alexis, let me just say, Anisha, that's a great example of Steve Cartman's work on the Drama Triangle, which was an Eric Byrne Award winning uh, article um, that people can find. It's referenced in all sorts of places and easy to find. And if anybody's looking for it, just send us a message or put it on the Facebook uh, page, the Project TA 101 Facebook page. Yeah, so we really can see how TA is so applicable for small children in a really simple way to understand. And it, in this way, it's really different from our traditional psychotherapy, Janice. Mm -hmm. Right? It, it's, I mean, it's, the, yes, well, I think that Eric Byrne originally was uh, created TA because he wanted to give people some practical tools rather than having that sort of unbalanced um, he himself rebelled a little bit against his psychoanalytic training where it was very uh, unequal power, he felt. Um, so it is quite different in that way. And there are these very practical tools as well as practicing TA in depth uh, in terms of dealing with script issues and uh, relational approach. Um, so there are many, many different approaches within the TA um, theory. Mm -hmm. uh, and let me introduce Susan now. She is a PSTA um, also. <laughs> Sorry, I, Lola, I don't have my, <laughs> uh, my disorganization. Okay. Um, okay, Susan Eccles is a PTSTA in psychotherapy and a person-centered counselor in the UK. And I'm so glad you made it. Can you explain to us what a person-centered counselor is? Oh, right. Well, I mean, how long have I got? A couple of minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, a person-centered counselor, the training was developed by um, a psychologist, an American psychologist called Carl Rogers, and he believed that people were the expert on themselves, as indeed Eric Byrne did, and he developed um, a theory where basically he was saying that the relationship was the most important, if you like, thing between people, and, the most in, and that we were all relational seeking beings. So if you think of something like the drama triangle, people get on that because they're seeking a relationship. They may be seeking it in a way that's not in their best interests because the roles are inauthentic, but what they're really wanting is, an, is a relationship, a real relationship. So Carl Rogers believed that that was the most important thing between human beings. And so the theory he developed was one of how do you create a relationship whereby the other person can enter into a relationship with you. So that was really, in a nutshell, I suppose, what he was wanting to develop. So that's so, my basic training. Okay, and so do you see uh, the relationship because TA is all about transactions between people, which I suppose is the relationship. So does it tie in together really well? Well, I think it does. I mean, I had a lot of difficulty when I first started training in TA because of course in those days, before the relational model was developed by Hargard and Sills, it was very much cognitive because Byrne wanted to cure his patients. So he set about, well, I've got a whole hospital full of patients. They're not, they're not brain damaged. 
They're not ill. They're not under the influence of drugs. So why can't they be operational? So he developed, although, first of all, he did develop, I think, the theory of intuition, which he never actually developed, but he went on to develop a cognitive theory and classical TA. And I found that quite difficult to um, integrate, but actually it's quite possible. And the basis of you're quite right that transactions are, if you like, conversations between people because mm -hmm. people are relational so they're going to transact aren't they mm -hmm. what the I, is, is explains things in a cognitive way i like that mm -hmm. so do so you use both uh, systems in your practice well people have asked me that i suppose i must be an amalgamation of both systems yes mm -hmm. Good mm -hmm. question yes and let me see what else I had for you. You are, yes, so you are a moderator now of the uh, Facebook group TA101, Project TA101. Well, you're kindly invited by Janice. Yeah, that's wonderful. How do you, and this is a question to all three of you, how do you feel people can, um, how can they get involved to create an active and lively community? Oh. How do you see that? I, I can give an example already of what, what I know is happening. Um, so people are doing the modules at their own pace. They're watching the videos. They're talking about the, the uh, questions in the learning guide. They're talking about the references and material in the learning guide. And they're posting their answers to the discussion questions. And so one of my friends um, in in the southern US tells me that she introduced someone to the course and he's he said there are already people on module three and four I've, I've only finished module two I've got to catch up because he wanted to get in on the discussions that are happening about module three and four so people are already starting to um, respond to one another in relation to the concepts that are under discussion. And that's really exciting. It's, it's really taking a life of its own, like a um, sort of yeah. like an online course. And so um, Anisha and Sue will be active participants and moderators in answering your questions mm -hmm. and have comments and yeah. So that's mm -hmm. wonderful. And Janice, you will be there too. Oh yes, I will. Janice, can you talk a little bit about the faculty uh, of Project TA 101? Well, yes, I can. As I said, um, we challenged uh, Van Joins to put together this innovative TA 101 with, and we suggested that he, um, uh, Valerie Batts, who we knew had done a lot of work, uh, Dr. Graham Barnes and Felipe Garcia, might also want to contribute to this because we were reviewing their work for another project um, and knew that each of them had a body of work that applied TA concepts to social justice uh, and social change. So um, Van took up the took up the challenge. He um, invited them to come and they put their heads together and created this unique. 101 that covers all the official content of the 101 and um, talks about social justice applications of the concepts or mm -hmm. cultural change or um, various social issues in relation to the concepts and systemic change. So we were so excited that they were willing to do that. Um, and they were so excited that it was gonna be available worldwide. Thing. Yeah, and I was there. I took it. It was my first real introduction uh, to TA101. And it was so incredible because you get to hear it from their experience. I mean, they are all master teachers and they were just not just covering the basic material, but we got it with their complete uh, experience, uh, which was just phenomenal. And I've been watching it again and again, also through the modules. <laughs> I'm really studying it because I'm doing my, um, my, um, um, my training, the TAP training. And so I'm using uh, this to jump off from, which is amazing. I'm learning so much 
there's such valuable material right there. So each one of them has been practicing for over 45 years and yeah. teaching for over four, and they've taught together uh, a number of times in the past. So it's really exciting to see them kind of gel together as a, as a fa wonderful faculty. Um, Susan, I wanted to ask you, what is the community like in the UK, the TA community? It's marvellous. I mean, exactly like Bern always wanted. You know, he developed in, in his hospital with his registrars and it developed into community and it's got bigger and bigger. And of course, now with the internet and ways of moving around, I mean, it, it has gone on developing. I mean, I'm getting sort of fairly elderly now, I suppose, and I see all the young people like you, you know, mastering all this internet. And I think it's wonderful. And I think it's been wonderful for TA. And one of the trainers locally, she was in marketing. And she, I suppose, when she started her training school must have been about 12, 15 years ago, she was one of the first people to really get on the internet and promote TA. So yes, it's uh, Leilani, Le Leilani, uh, you're, I guess you're yeah, talking Leilani. about. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I'm studying with them too. I'm totally oh. into TA now, I love it. Oh yes, I'm taking a course with them and I've taken many of the two hour courses and she is wonderful, so yeah. But, well, you know, and of course she was a big cheese in, in changing the name of um, the ITA to Yukata because, well, I mean, she did and she did an awful lot of work there. And yes, she's been a huge promoter of TA in the yeah. So, yes. And my, my, my trainer here, Marion Weisberg, she was one of the first people to bring TA to Europe. So I'm training with her, so I'm very oh. fortunate. And I will introduce her to the community as well soon. <laughs> so great. Yeah. So we have promised some uh, for you uh, to cover some, T some important TA concepts. And I would like to start with Anisha. Can you explain uh, the ego states? Can you just give us a little idea of what they are and how they work? Yeah, sure. Um, so before I get into explaining what ego states are, um, I'm going to narrate a small incident. Yeah. So when my dear friend Alexis uh, came up with this whole idea of Facebook Live, I saw how I, how I had varied reactions to it. Yeah. And my first reaction was, wow, this sounds like such a fun idea. It'll be so good to create, uh, to create something new. It'll be so good to interact with the international audience. I am super excited, yeah? But as the day started passing, I saw my energy shifting. And then I caught myself saying, Facebook Live, hmm. Well, people are experiencing too much of screen fatigue. Who will come for the sessions? And um, Anisha, you are an over enthusiastic cutlet. You don't think before saying yes, anything new and you just want to run. I, you have no experience doing Facebook Live. How are you going to manage this? And after some time, I saw my energy shifting again. I heard a voice in my head which said, well, the fact of the matter is that Project TA 101 is completely online. And Facebook Live is uh, one great option to create uh, more aliveness in the community and to elicit interest of the participants. Uh, for sure, I have no experience of doing Facebook Live before. Uh, but if I don't try, how will I ever know whether it works for me or not? So let's just go ahead and see how it goes. So as you see, one situation, one person, and three different reactions. Now this entire phenomenon of three different reactions can be beautifully explained by the concept of ego states. Ego states is one of the core concepts in TA and what it basically refers to the structure of personality. Now, what do I mean by that? In very simple terms, let's say this is me, okay? Now this one me is divided into three me's. What do I mean by that? So 
So first is the parent me or the parent ego state. So this basically entails all thoughts, feelings and behaviors that I have copied directly from my parents or any significant elders who played an important role in my upbringing. Yeah. So it refers to the copied set of behaviors, copied way of thinking, copied way of feeling. Then is the child me or the child ego state. This basically refers to ways of thinking, feeling and behaving that I'm replaying from my own childhood. What I used to do as a child, my ways of being, yeah? And the third is the adult. When I think, act and feel in ways that are very appropriate to the here and now. So as you see, parent and child are archaic. They are from then and there. And they, they represent people, real people who existed. They're not abstract concepts. They're about real people from the then and there. Whereas adult is the here and now. So in the example that I gave you all about my reaction to Alexis, my first reaction being, wow, this sounds like fun, seemed to be coming from my child ego state. Because I remember, and I've been told that I was a very uh, enthusiastic kid and I really looked forward to new opportunities. And then this voice of uh, wisdom, which said that Anisha, think before you leap. This voice of skepticism is very similar to that of my father. He really believed in that, that think before you leap, don't just jump in. And then when I shifted and I said, well, the fact of the matter is that this is an online project and there is no other way I can reach out to my audience apart from doing this live sessions. So at that moment, I was in my adult ego state, mm -hmm. looking at the facts of the matter. So what do these ego states mean? Ego state basically mean consistent set of thoughts, feelings, and action. Good. Beautiful, nice wonderful. Listening. Yeah, very nice, thank you. And after we go through all, all of you, uh, we're gonna have questions from the audience. I'm not gonna ask questions, but this was a beautiful explanation. And I would like to go to Janice, uh, contracts. In TA, we make contracts. What are they and why are they important? Well, contracts, simply put, are an ex explicit agreement about specific goals that we have in our agreement. And in any of the four fields of transactional analysis, whether it's psychotherapy, um, counseling, education, or organizations, the contract ex defines what the responsibilities and commitments of each person involved in the contract or each party of the contract uh, has. So what are responsibilities and what are commitments of each? Uh, Byrne first talked about contracts in relation to uh, psychotherapy. And he talked about two types of contracts, hard contracts and soft contracts. Now, hard contracts are very specific and they can be um, based in achieving autonomy. That is changing the life script, which you'll find out more about in the um, module six of the video. Uh, so autonomy contracts and uh, hard, our hard contracts, as well as the specific behavioral ones that um, outline a, a specific measurable goal. Now, those contracts tend to be used in classical transactional analysis and in the redecision approach. Um, soft contracts, Byrne uh, talked a little bit about those, and they're more commonly used often in relational um, approaches to transactional analysis. There might be a contract to explore, to understand the process, uh, whether it's the change process or the process of what's happening between the client and the therapist. Um, both are important in the change process. And um, I think that uh, it's very important for in the art of 
you doing contracting to figure out which is the most appropriate at the time. That really is the fine art of setting contracts. So why is why are contracting uh, why is contracting important? Um, well, transactional analysis was among the first approach to use contracts in therapy. Um, it, it increases the agency and the autonomy of the client who gets who sets their own goals and their direction and pace of the work that's going to happen. Um, it also recognizes the person's capacity to think and to make decisions. Um, it spells out, as I said, the responsibilities and the commitments of both the client and the therapist. And um, in some ways, it's an effort to balance the power in the relationship more evenly in the therapy relationship. Um, contracts are very important uh, in the ethical application of TA in all four fields of specialization um, for having clear and informed consent. Although in each field, there'll be a different focus and different goals. Um, it's very important for ethical practice. Um, and finally, uh, in module eight section, the section of the learning guide and the six question, you'll find the six questions for clear contracting. Uh, and you'll find more about the Steiner's four elements of contract, which is very important in contracting theory. Um, and so much to learn. Eight, one more <laughs> thing. Uh, Valerie Batts and Felipe Garcia talk, uh, make comments about the fine art of contract setting, which is a practice that takes time and, and uh, experience. Yeah, wonderful. I mean, there, the, like I say, there is a lot to learn for somebody like me who's just starting on this journey. Um, it seems like there's really a lot of technique to this. And I don't know if you saw my little interview with Fanita, but she said that contracts are so important because there's also a clear end. When you finish your contract, you're done. And either you can make another contract or therapy is finished. So yeah. I think that's also really important about making contracts which is different from other therapies. Well, and, and I think one of Eric Burns complaints about the psychoanalysis that he had was that it was never done. Exactly. He wanted measurable goals having, coming from that perspective. Yeah, so how important is that? And again, for people today, they don't, people don't want to be in therapy for 30 years. So this is really attractive to have this practical application with a beginning and an end. And you're going to learn all so much about yourself. And it's wonderful. Of course, one of our ethics is that people stop when they want to. Uh -huh. I was going to ask you about the ethics, but I don't want to get into no, we'll talk too much. About we'll talk about that another time. It's just for me. I'm so interested in all yeah. of this. Um, thank you so much. And, and we'll wait for questions to come in for Janice also. And so Susan, can you explain to us the drama triangle? And Anisha already explained a little bit, but I'd like to hear your presentation. I really like your enthusiasm, it's great, and your questions. Yes, the drama triangle. I particularly like the drama triangle because, as I said earlier, it's a way of demonstrating that we want to connect to one another. You know, we're relational, seeking relation uh, creatures, and if we want to relate to someone um, about something, we might use the tri drama triangle if we're too frightened to be straight, authentic, um, or we may not know how to do it. So if we look at the, di the diagram of the drama triangle, which I think you're all familiar, yeah? Can you, uh, can you move it up a little bit? A bit? Yeah. Yeah, people are not all familiar. Just give it one moment to, a little higher. A little higher, yeah. 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 Okay, so you can explain it, yes. I can explain it. So There's look an R. Diagram, and... You can see that there are three positions. The P for persecutor, can you see it? No, oh, a little higher. A bit higher? A little bit higher, even. A little higher. Oh, yeah, move back. You can. Yes, now we can see it. Now you can see it. Yes. <laughs> I'll, I'll obliterate my face, all right? <laughs> Just for a moment. Move it back. Move it back, please. And higher. <laughs> ah! There we go. Ah, can you see okay. it? Thank you. Yep. Tell me. Okay, I think people, people, yeah. 
They have seen it. Now we want to see your face again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you can see that. You see yes. that. So as you can see, there are three positions on the prime. The persecutor, the rescuer, and the victim. They're all roles. They're not authentic. So they're like actors in a drama. And the ability, like, an, like a drama, is that they can switch. You can see the arrows going round and round. Mm -hmm. so what happens is if you're in a persecutor role, you might switch to a rescuer. Or if you're in a victim role, you might switch to a persecutor or a rescuer or back again. So to give you a little example, um, for example, a wife might say to her husband, I don't feel very well. A perfectly normal, okay statement. He might then say helpfully, well, have you phoned the doctor? Another reasonable statement. Then she might reply, oh, no, they're no good. They wouldn't want to help. There's no point in doing anything like that. So from that point of view, she's coming from the victim role mm -hmm. on the triangle. So instead of him saying off the triangle, he might respond from... Well, I can't see why you're saying that. I mean, why would you do that? Why wouldn't they help you? I mean, that's ridiculous. So he then goes on to the persecutor role to her victim. Now she has a choice there. Can you see it? Yeah. She might decide, I want to get off this triangle. So she might say, oh, that's probably better that I actually do phone the doctor. You're right. So if you, in terms of transactions, she actually crosses the transaction, if you've done transactions, or she might perpetuate her victim role and saying, well, you know that doctors are no good. I'm not going to phone them. So that is the element of it. Or she might switch. Can, you, yep. can we see your face now? I think we've seen the, or, we'd like to see your pretty face. Or she <laughs> might switch from her victim role to persecute him as saying, why are you so unkind to me? Don't speak to me like that. So the point of the drama triangle is you could go round and round and round. Oh. It feels authentic, right, to people when people get into a drama triangle. I guess when you study TA, it starts to feel less authentic, but. But the thing about it is, is that when you go round and round and round, at the end of the day, you're going to feel rotten, aren't you? Mm -hmm. So, so you... yeah, why do we do this? Why oh. do we create drama triangles? Well, as I say, we want a relationship with somebody, but we may not know how to do it. So the best thing is to do that, because at least mm -hmm. we connect with them. They're responding, aren't they? And we're responding, but it's not very nice. It's not very happy, and it's not very real, because actually the wife could actually say, I don't feel very well, but actually I'm scared to phone the doctor because I'm scared of what the doctor might say, which is what might go behind her saying, well, I'm not going to phone the doctor, they're useless. Mm -hmm. And as he might be frightened of being helpful, so instead of saying, well, I know you feel rotten, let me phone the doctor for you, or what can I do for you? He then goes into a persecutor role of attacking her because he's frightened, perhaps, to say, I want to help you. Do you think we get into the same dra drama triangles all the time as human beings? Well, that's an interesting question. I could ask you what you think about that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have the experts here. <laughs> um, pr probably, oh. probably, yes, till you become aware of it because it's some, some circle that you're used to. Yeah. Well, I, I could say something. To, I could comment about that. Jackie Schiff defined a game as a, uh, a t an un an attempt to resolve an old unresolved symbiosis or an angry reaction to that old unresolved uh, relationship. Um, so from that perspective, there'd be some similarities to the, you know, the over and over again quality yeah. of yeah. the games. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so there's so much to learn and 
Yeah, Susan, did you have one more um, thing to add before we get to the questions? Because there's so, I mean, we could stay on for hours, I think, but we have to get to the questions and get on with the rest of our night, Anisha, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> um, did you have one more thing to add, Sue, to this? Did, I thought you were saying something before and I interrupted oh, you. No, that's fine. No? Okay. Yeah. Lola, are there any questions? Um, Oh, I, well, we can continue chatting then if there's not too many questions. So I think, oh, Lola's just pulling the question. So um, telling everybody to go to the Facebook page, T, Project TA101, and also on YouTube, and we've posted the links above, so people can just go and press on the links, and then subscribe to the YouTube channel. Yes, please. Then you can get subscribe, and then you can watch all these wonderful, amazing modules over and over again it's really gr such great study material so and then when you go to the facebook group you have this wonderful team here and they will be answering your your questions and comments and share so we really would like to have an active community yeah. people talking and it's really fun we'll be putting uh, our comments on the facebook uh posts as well as and our questions and interacting with people to uh, see respond to any questions or discuss the topics with them. Great. Um, so I have a question here. How do you stay out of the triangle when one does not participate in it? And um, others in the triangle wish to pull you back in it. Ah. Oh. That's an interesting question. Well, the trick is to get off it. And the really safe position, as Anisha was saying, and when she was describing structural ego states, is to get into adult and to get thinking. Mm. As Burns said, everybody can think, and that is true, unless they're under the influence of drugs or alcohol, which is a drug, isn't it? So it's applying adult thinking to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Do you any Janice or Anisha have something to add or? Go ahead, uh, Stephen Kaufman has given this uh, lovely steps because he spoke about the compassion triangle as well. And he speaks about the six steps if you want to get out of the drama triangle. And he says that when you catch yourself in the persecutor role, you apologize for your behavior. And when you, uh, when you see yourself in the rescuer role, you, you step back and you talk about your longing, your desire to contribute and ask a straight question about how do you, uh, about uh, what is the help that the other person is needing. And third is when you find yourself in a victim position, then you show your openness, your vulnerability and ask for support that you really want. And if somebody else, as the question is, if somebody else is, you know, kind of putting you into the triangle, depending on where they are. So for example, if they are coming in from the persecutor, so while you first show that you're hearing, but also then give them feedback and also apologize for what about you could have pushed them into behaving like that. So for example, the, the, the story that I gave you about the fight between my son and my husband, so when my, my son tells my husband that, Daddy, I don't like it when you pat me and wake me up. Uh, but I also know that I, I am behaving difficult early morning. You called me up five times where I didn't get up. So it's also owning up what you're doing so that the person is having no other choice but to persecute. So giving mm -hmm. that. Second is when you see somebody in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the rescuer position, see how you acknowledge their efforts, give them appreciation. Mm -hmm. And if somebody's in the victim position, then you give them, uh, 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 Kaufman has said, give sympathy, but that doesn't resonate with me. So I believe in giving empathy and looking at how we can support them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. So it's really uh, all of that that we learn through studying transactional analysis, because it sounds like you have to become really aware <laughs> of the way where we can position ourselves, right? to mm -hmm. all of you. And we've all been doing this for a while now. So thank you, Anisha. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. I have one more question. It's coming. 
Um, how did it feel to talk? Oh, <laughs> that's to me, <laughs> how it felt to talk to Vanita, <clears throat> English. Um, yeah, when I met her was last year and uh, I was visiting her and she was 103. And it was, she's a powerhouse. She's so powerful and so strong and uh, just wonderful, smart and in attunement, wonderful. And actually, um, I hope to do something else with her. So I'm going to reach out to her and see if we can get something else going. Yeah, she's just wonderful. And I think we should have her on again, don't you think? Yes. I agree. You know, she has so much to offer. Her and, work on uh, the rackets system, uh, the rackets uh, is just, as a substitution factor is really, really innovative and important. Um, so I hope you'll get to talk with her. Yeah, again. we'll do our best. And well, all of you, this was really wonderful. All of you are wonderful and your contributions to the TA world. Thank you so much. And for everybody that will see this, uh, please go to Project TA 101 on Facebook and have an interactive communication with all these wonderful moderators. And I thank all of you for being here and everybody that is watching. Thank you. Thank you, Alexis, for and Lola for hosting this and Sue and Anisha. It's been so great to be with you today. Yeah. Thank you, Janice. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. It was good fun. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's been fun. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bye. Alexis, and all of you.